Misha, you are back at Coachman's Tree. You made your way back. It was a lot faster than searching for Ness. And you are actually on the racetrack that we started last episode on, the one where people are racing. There has been a lull in the racing. There's not a race right now, but you are on the track and you are in a vehicle. Just one of their like standard default vehicles. You know, it's like just a regular car with googly eyes and like bouncy balls for the front wheels. And the horn probably <laughs> does La Cucaracha or whatever, because that's just the standard comedy horn. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll do a different song. But it's, it, do, it does the Steel Samurai theme from Phoenix, right? Yes! There we go. <laughs> okay, excellent. That is approved. <laughs> do 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 which Misha has pressed this horn many times. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but Misha is not in the driver's seat. They were very quickly taken out of it. Here's where everyone is. On the balcony, we have a few folks. So we have watching the car. We have Ellie just leaning on her shoulder, buzzing. We have CK on, I, I'm guessing like on Ellie's lap. We just have Ness who's being held a bit too tight. Just a little bit, but he's not scrubbing away from it. He might be fussing with the paper. Okay. Because I don't know if this is going to come up, but he, he was fully planning on above where the signature is, writing like, I, Jimmy Wynn, seed this race to Misha Jarvis or something. <laughs> related to fraud that was why he was trying to get the signature it was never about the autograph he just wanted to make him commit perjury oh my god he said it needs to be legal size for reasons and i was like it needs to be legal size that was yes. <laughs> that was why so this he's running he's he's like scribbling he's not telling anybody about it because he would really rather jimmy like introspect and then grow as a person however this is a backup so you're all up there. Meanwhile, Misha, you and Ayn are in this car, the Udgy car. You're both wearing your like get up. So you're in your speedy speed boys outfit. You've got that helmet that wraps around your back, but doesn't cover the ears or the face. And Ayn, in fact, has her full get up with her astronaut helmet on as well. But here's the trick. You're not in the driver's seat. Ayn is. So this is our observation practice. It's kind of the first practice we do as the speedy speed boys. Okay. What am I supposed to observe? Well, everything. Normally, while driving, with the help of Stein, of course, I'm able to drive perfectly fine. He observes the surroundings through the car and relays the information back to me. But today, and she takes a little like switch on the side of her helmet and flips it off and Stein's voice suddenly clips off. Today, you're going to be my Stein. Do you need me to use my kazoo? <laughs> No, no, words are are fine. Words are good. What I mean is that the first rule of good riding is observation. You need to pay attention to your surroundings. So you're going to pay attention to the surroundings and then tell me how to respond. Okay. She goes into neutral and the car like steadily creeps forward. Uh, she puts her hands on the wheel. Perfect positioning, of course. Three and nine or two and... 10. I think it's three and nine now. I don't know. It's been 10 years since I went to driver school. What? I have no idea. I don't yeah, she does it the old grandma way where it's just the bottom of the wheels. Terrible. And you can see in the distance there's a, a turn where you have to turn left and the car slowly moves forward. Oh, uh, well, I see my small friend Ness, and I see Ellie B next to him. I also see two stars currently in the sky, although I believe one of them might be a planet. <laughs> I also see, and I'm just gonna keep going with that. Do you ever actually say a turn is coming up? Uh, they do, but like when the turn is like really close, like, and I see the end of the road, meaning that it is time to turn towards the left right now right now right now but like without giving any leeway like right now like right now it's like right in here you know the thing where you're driving you just go up the curb a little bit yeah it's the equivalent of that just goes up on the metal curb except it's not it's like ramps but turns a bit too late and she turns over and she says that was a excellent observation although we tend to focus on the road well 
I believe that your instructions were to tell you about all of the things that I observed. I was simply complying with your instructions. Yes. If you only watched me to observe the road, I could only observe the road. Uh, Ayn, you just see the astronaut helmet turn towards you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, the road is great. I will do so then. Fantastic. Are you comfortable to continue? Oh, certainly. Are you comfortable to continue? <laughs> and that's when she slams on the acceleration and the car speeds off down the racetrack. The road is going at a, at a significantly faster <laughs> speed than it was before. And she can't help but laugh and goes, that's the idea. And Ari, I need you to give me a roll, give me a number and give me a direction. Uh, okay. Northeast and 12. Ein makes the turn and says cardinal directions are fantastic, but in relation to the car is where our main focus is. Oh, well, in that case, right to... She turns right and just jumps off a ramp Did because you didn't say when right. You saw you had to turn right in like 30 feet, but you said it right now. Oh. So she just turned, flies off a <laughs> ramp, lands down somewhere else on the racetrack and just woo! Which actually will really like that. Like, whoa! <laughs> like they will like scream really excited about that. <laughs> well, that was fun. I mean, not. <laughs> All right, give me, give me another one. All right. In... 19 feet, turn left. With that one, Ayn keeps going straight. And you could tell she should have turned like a few seconds ago. You're about to hit a wall and she's going faster and faster. Wait. And she doesn't seem to be turning. I said to turn. Tur turn. It's, it's, we're almost at the 19 feet. The astronaut helmet turns towards you and you can't see Ayn smile, but you can see just a glisten on her visor. And then she cranks the wheel to the left as the car skids, turns almost completely on its side, and the bouncy ball wheels hit off the wall, and the car flies forward at an even faster velocity. That's horrifying, and I love it. Michelle, Michelle also loves it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like really excited about it. Like, they, they want to be annoyed with Ayn, but they can't because it's actually really fun. He's like, oh, you did that on purpose, didn't you? You knew! You knew it would do that. <laughs> At least try not to crush Ness. <laughs> well, you gave me specific instructions. <laughs> I must admit that was that was really fun. <laughs> and she just she's just happy. She's just like ah ha ha. You continue the skid back and forth and like you're just consumed by like the colors and the excitement flashes of just like red as you're like about to skid almost like oh red stop but then it keeps going and like you know it bounces off and then there's almost like a flash of red as you do another attack thing and then another flash of red as Ein's face gives way and you just see a blank faced male figure in the driver's seat. In the driver's seat? Yeah, where Ein would, there's this, what looks like to be basically a man, but the face, you can't see anything there. It's, it's all kind of like blurry. Uh, I? You don't hear a, a response back. Is the car still moving forward? The car's still moving forward. In fact, you turn ahead and you see, you could have sworn that you were supposed to go a different way. You thought you were supposed to go left, but the track looks right and, and everything seems to be tinted red. Okay, uh, Misha will say, Ayn, Ayn, if you, if you can hear me, stop the car, please, please. And then, and then they will, they will try to unbuckle their own belt, if there's a belt. I don't know if there's a belt in this car, but they will try to leave the car while, while being like, Ayn, please, if you can hear me, please stop the car, please. And my role is a seven. How do you go to leave the car? Basically, like, just an impulsive thing, like, leaning towards the door or, like, reaching towards where they would think the door is. If there's a handle, I don't know exactly the physics of this car, but wherever there's, like, the thing to open the door and try to do it while telling Ayn to stop the car. But also, they're going to try and start counting like Ellie taught Misha to do. You go to grab the handle on the car. 
one. And you reach for it, but suddenly the car jerks to the side and you fly backwards and this hand reaches over across the man onto the steering wheel. Two. And it jerks the wheel to the left and the face turns over to you and you can't see an expression except for a bit of concern. Three. And then the figure disappears in a burst of crimson. And then on the count of ten, you wake up. You can see the treetops above you, but it quickly gives way as these two bug eyes, each illuminated with a bright red light, come in front of you and you hear, Now there's that other beautiful red light. Go away. But I was just saying, oh! And he gets just shoved off to the side as the astronaut rushes in his place and Ayn quickly takes off the helmet and sets it to the side. Misha, Misha, are you all right? Misha, at the same time as Ayn is saying that, will be like, Ayn, are you all right? I'm, I'm, I am fine. What, what happened? Nothing, nothing. I, uh, I I just lost track of, of, of the road, that's all. I got distracted by all of the lights in here and... I forgot to look at the road, and so uh, I couldn't give you directions because of that, but it's fine. I'm fine now. And Ayn is just sitting there, and she does not believe your story for a second. Mm-hmm. Misha, I just, I, I have one more question. What color was the road? What What do you mean? It, it, it was too dark? I couldn't... What color was the road, Misha? And suddenly Ayn, who had been very, like, quiet and, like, I don't want to step on any toes or anything. Yeah. But she looks frightening. (laughs) It was red, as well as everything. (laughs) It didn't... didn't... it didn't fucking work. All... all of that, and it led to nothing. What are you talking about? And Ellie and Ness... You see Ayn, who has been kind of kneeling over Misha. She turns to you, and she just says, Come on, there's something I have to show Welcome to the announcement break for Quest Friends episode 67, One Neon Night Part 9. I am Kyle, your GM, and our intro and outro songs are Friends and Hitoshio, both by Miracle of Sound. Today's announcement break was pretty early in the episode, so I'll keep it nice and short. Today, all I wanted to do is do a quick shout out for Ryan Shanks. Ryan was one of the players in Tom's original Numenera campaign, and he is the creator of Rocky and Shanks Fossil, who we transformed into the NPC of Rock Ryan Shanks Fossil. That's right, this strange, strange fossil-loving man not only knows Anastasia Brackleberry, but was part of her core-like group as she reclaimed Anquan. How? Why? I ask these questions because I don't have an answer. Anyways, thanks again so much, Ryan, for letting us use Rock Ryan Shanks Fossil. He was a blast to play, and I hope he was at least half as strange as he was when you played him. This week's episode was a week late, but because I really want to keep on our schedule, we're actually going to be releasing our next episode in one week, so it might not be exactly on Monday, but sometime next week, and hopefully... On Monday, November 23rd, you will be listening to our next episode, One Neon Night, Part 10. But if you'd like additional content before then, you can find stories, artwork, and behind-the-scenes insights at patreon.com slash questfriends. I'll see you there. Hop, you know fossils. You've seen fossils. Yeah. Shock, you know of fossils. You've learned about fossils. And Rock Ryan, 
Rock Ryan lives fossils. He is in and of himself almost a fossil who collects them. And in all of your combined experience, you've never seen anything like this. The whispers, they start to rise again. Gath and Holly travel the world, jump in a parachute, fancy macaroons. I usually just get the cheaper, ugly ones. I was lost. I was lost. I was lost. And these whispers conglomerate. And you realize that the whispers aren't coming from vocals. They're vibrating out of the sounds of these fossils. These small bricks that have combined together to make the shape of a hand, which reaches around the corner and grips the wall of the room you're in. The whispers get louder. They're a mix between whispers and a wind. And as they do, the remainder of the creature comes into the room. Two large hands, humanoid-like legs, a rotund body. But as it moves and it stumbles, it seems to crumble under its own weight, moving delicately enough to not hurt any of its individual parts, but with enough force to cause a lot of hurt to you. What, what, what was everyone's initiative rolls? I got a 10. 13. So hop. You're in the room. You got Red's blessing, but you lost your way out because the preserve is right in front of it. What are you going to do in the first round of combat? Um, so that nifty tunnel I discovered earlier, useless now. Useless. It's, uh, it's on the complete opposite side of the cube you are in. Great, 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 great. Would you count the preserve as an environmental obstacle. It is not an environmental obstacle. It is a sentient being. Made of the environment. When we chose this rule, we specifically chose it under the specifications that it couldn't just mean anything. I don't remember that. (laughs) All right, fine. In that case, um, Pop feels like it is very likely that we cannot fight this thing head on because I believe it was said in character during a conversation with B and Rock Ryan that only the steel that Ellie has could hurt it, right? I don't know if they said that but they definitely rock ryan is a fighter he really is okay and this thing is still alive quote unquote so that pretty much tells you all you need to know yeah okay i mean the vibe is don't fight it so i would like to trap it somehow or at least immobilize it so that we can book it okay i would like to use an xp or two to have something available Uh, we're gonna do a net trap now. I'm gonna lasso something around its leg and just just yank it. Yeehaw, partner. Yeah. Sure. Yeehaw. Sure. All right, is that one or two XP to have a thing I can use to lasso? Let's do one. Okay. And you're gonna know why in a second. Mm -mm. Shock, you see Hop run over to an item titled Lake's Failure. No! And he goes and he picks up what looks like a tape measure. (laughs) Lake would love tape measures. Lake loved tape measures. Uh, I'm going to lasso this tape measure. Here I go. Can I put in into this? I'd like to, will calculate help me? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to use calculate and I'm going to put two levels of effort in because I get one free tier with my edge. That's a, that's a nine. So Lake's failure was called Lake's failure for two important reasons. One, it was made by Lake. Two, it failed. You whip out the tape measure and it just extends around the legs of this creature, the like fossilized legs. And you know how the tape measure can press a button to cause it all to recoil? Yeah. You press the little button to cause it all to recoil with the idea that it would scrunch around this thing's legs, causing it to trip. And as it goes to crush, it slips through the cracks between the fossils and just kind of jumbles itself in the middle before returning to you. So you didn't stop it, but you do get to keep the artifact. Yay! I have a tape measure. In response to that, Hop will... That didn't work. That's unnecessary. But, you know, he says it. All right, Shock. Shock is going to use three XP at once, all that I have remaining. Okay. And I'm going to try for something... um, trying to remember the name of the first of the pedestal artifacts because i know it was an alliteration and i respect that about it there was tobias's promise and olive's was it olive's attempt Uh, i guess that must have been it i guess it wasn't an alliteration my whole life's a lie but anyway 
Shock is going to take Olive's attempt, which looks almost like a cross between a vase and a candelabra that was like peeled open, I'm going to say. Shock is going to run up, grab this artifact, run a hand along it, and all of a sudden, veins along it start to glow and pulse a bit, and it it gets a little too hot for Shock to hold, so he just sort of tosses it. And I want it to just turn a chunk of the floor to goop that just like falls away. And I want that floor to be directly below the, uh, the, uh, I'm so sorry. The preserve. Preserve, thank you. I want it to be large enough such that the preserve falls through the floor. Yeah, so this candelabra vase goes and it opens up and it hits on the floor and outside of it goops out this weird goop that consumes that tile of the floor and causes the preserve to just fall down. You notice actually at first that it doesn't seem to fall immediately. It almost seems to be floating itself in the air and just giving the illusion of walking. But did it look down and that's when it fell? (laughs) Yes, it looks down as some of the goop attaches itself onto one of the fossils. And you can't tell if it got pulled down or if it just fell down to pursue the fossil. But you can see part of its leg rips off for four points of damage and it falls down through the hole. And Rock Ryan just goes, "Eh, time to leave. And he just (laughs) picks up his shovel, turns back to B and says, B, we gotta go. And you can see B and Cubo are both using their lights to look at something. I think it says flight controls. B, we gotta go now. Oh, okay. And B swoops back into the vine and both of them take off over the hole and start running. I'm assuming you do, you two do as well. Yeah. Uh, Shock is going to, against his better judgment, read what they were looking at before he leaves. I mean, we've got to pick up Kubo anyway. Yeah. As you go to pick up Kubo, it's exactly as B says. It's a little pedestal with room for light to go inside of it that says red module flight controls i guess i take cubo and leave i don't know (laughs) how to use that we would need b for that right and we have we have no real reason to make this fly again so yeah we motor away yeah we'll just skedaddle okay you book it and you have a full turns with the book but from behind you two of the hands reach out again and the preserve pulls itself up And as it pulls itself up, you see one of the legs twitch in and turn into more of a ghostly tail-like shape as the bits of the fossils that had been pulled off previously return back and the two legs fuse into a single tail as it gets those four HP back and is back to full health. From down the hallway, you're running, and Rock Ryan's like, (laughs) panting as he runs down one way, and behind you, you hear the whispers rattling through the fossils, and rattling through the walls, like vibrating in the fossils and into the walls themselves. A giant cockroach. Are you keeping him down here? They would be hamburger. And as you round the corner, you see in front of Rock Ryan, illuminated by B's light, a giant fish just emerge from around the corner as more and more fossils come to fill it. And one whisper just finally says, See ya. <laughs> as it punches him in the face and he flies back against the wall behind him. Hop, it is your turn. Okay, so as the fist came out and Rock Ryan just flies backwards past Hop, Hop is going to go into like a baseball slide, like on his heel so that he can go under the preserve. Okay, yeah, it's pretty slow. It's just the fist you can see, most of it turned into the fist. So it's like reforming back into its general shape. Okay, and then while it's doing that, after I underneath the preserve, I have a box that holds a diorama of whatever room the user is in. An alteration to the diorama will perform the same alteration to the room itself, and I would like to make a separate cube room inside the diorama that locks the preserve in a space that isn't shared with us. With no doors! So you open the diorama, Mm -hmm. and you see inside of it there is a little hallway, and then there is this big space. On the left side, just like in the real space on the left side, is the speedy speed boiler, On the right side is everything else. And you're on the right side right now coming out of the hallway. Okay. So what are you going to do to draw that line between you and the preserve? Will you allow me to combo with this? Uh, What do you want to combo? I want to pass another cipher to Hopper 
mirror to use as the cube in the diorama. Okay. I want to pass the pocket mirror cipher, which causes light to bounce back and forth between it. That's dope. I want to trap it in a giant pocket mirror, constantly lasering it back and forth. I'm going to trap him in a hall of mirrors. Okay. Ciphers automatically work. Ciphers automatically work. Yeah, do you, do you two want to describe this or do you want me to just describe it? So, so... Hopper slides underneath, right? Yeah. And Shock almost goes to throw it, thinks better of it, <laughs> just bats the mirror and just shouts, Hopper Scotch! And the mirror flies down towards where Hopper is. I like to imagine, as you hit it, Shock, it pops open and you see the light bing, 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 and each side starts to sear as it does. Hopper catches it by holding up the box, so he catches it in the box and it hits right on the preserve in the little box. And as it does, you notice, a vi- you feel a vibration above you. The space itself inside of red starts to shake and quake, and you can feel this heat coming down the walls, like an invisible force just slamming down on both sides. You could swear you almost see a reflection of the preserve in the wall, as both ends of the wall on the far side of this awning collapse mixing the fossils of the preserve with the newly made rubble of the red module walls. A Rock Ryan and be okay? Yeah, uh, the first thing Hop does after that happens is, Rock Ryan, you good? Yeah, you, you shout it into the void, and then out of the void, a hand just grabs you by the shoulder and pushes you to the side. <laughs> hey, I got a brand new bunch of fossils to get you kept up on your work, kid. I'm, I'm happy with you. That is very high praise. And Rock Ryan just keeps grumbling as he's digging through the rubble and picking up pieces of fossil and just sticking them inside of his little bag. Oh, okay, great. Take as many as you want, but I think we should hurry and get out of here while we can. More fossils away. He was saying that he doesn't want to come along with you because he still has lots of fossils to collect. And as we can see, these fossils are now completely harmless. And as B says that, you notice just like a little tentacle or arm, much smaller than the other ones, starts to rise. And this fist raises behind Rock, Ryan, and B as they say that. Can I panic whack it with my shield? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a roll. Panic whack! 11. You go to panic whack it and you just knock one of the pieces of rubble out of it, but it's still going. You rolled a 19. Nice. Please explain. <laughs> so there's a tentacle fist rising. Made out of fossils. F- rising. Of fossils. And you, but you can see this little like wind light ectoplasm that's a faint bright green in between the fossils. So just describe the scene as they see it. So this continues to rise out of the rubble and there's like little crumbling sounds as it's building size. And then all of a sudden it just stops moving and you can see little bits of silver poking through from behind. Little bits specifically of blue silver, azure steel, the one thing that can hit an incorporeal enemy and the thing Ellie's claws are made out of. And as the fossil just crumbles, you see standing behind it with her claws out, Ellie Badge. Ellie Badge, when did you get here? Right now, I stabbed a rock. (laughs) Thank you. Where's Misha? Uh, I am here, (laughs) Shaw. And Shock, you turn around to the other side and you see just walking through the entranceway, Misha, Ayn, and then CK. Ness? Is Ness there? Oh. Can I just have Ness, like, clinging to my back as my protege? Ness wanted in on the rock punching action. <laughs> yes, you don't see Ness, but he just clamors down. Clamors up. He's on top of Ellie's head now. <laughs> hey, Shock, it looks like you had more fun than we did. I I, th- I think it's a relative thing, Ness, but I'm glad to see you're okay. I don't have any relatives. <laughs> Shock doesn't respond to that. He just He's dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> and as you do that, a vine just goes next to you, Ness, and a little light goes to the end of the vine as the voice says, Relative. What does that word mean? 
Ellie unsheaths her claws again because she's not sure what's going on. Is this another ghost? She's not just going to go stab it, but she's got her claws out. And Chuck will have his hands up. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> a friend, a friend, a friend. Okay, okay, okay. No, not a ghost. Not a rock ghost. Hello. Hi, my name is B. And the vine rises up and just slaps itself down into your hand for a handshake. I'll shake it very gently. Satisfied bee curls back. I came from here and I am looking for fossils with my good friend. Rock Ryan. <laughs> Ryan. So I notice you all have made good company. Yeah. You find what you are looking for? Chuck will hold up. But actually, no, who, who is holding Red's Blessing? Because I assume Hopper would have pulled it out. No, you pulled it out. You used your... I, I was levering, so you had to Ness pull it. Ness grabs it out of whoever has it. <laughs> Me, I found it! What is this again? I don't really know what we're doing here. Don't wave it around! Like It, like, clunks against one of the <laughs> tables. Hopper just grabs it back. That That's Red's Blessing, isn't it? As far as we can tell, yeah. Looks more like a fancy stick to me. You seem pleasant. Uh, How did everything go back at the hideout, Misha? Uh, fine. It it, it went fine. Uh, I had a lot of fun racing with Ayn. Y- you, you should tell us all about your adventures, though. I would be glad to hear them. Oh. Ellie is giving Misha a look. <laughs> and the shock is doing that protagonist thing where he's like looking down so the hood is just shadowing over his eyes so you can't quite see them and he just says oh well i um i parted ways with the nano spirits i don't have any of my magic anymore wait what when what was that when you when you left wh- why did you do that shock it was while we were in here they um they weren't being very good people they were being very very rude, and they didn't understand who you are as a person. Oh. So if, if they were going to not let me even use my powers anyway, no sense sticking around. I I apologize, Shock. I, I didn't want to cause this to your powers, so... You didn't. I made this choice. My powers aren't what make me me. That is true. I apologize anyways, but I still say that it is even more impressive that you got this without your powers. I am really proud of you, Shock. Obviously also of you, Simon Scotch, but (laughs) both of you, really. Shock will do that, like, awkward hairbrush thing, like, oh, huh, I used up most of uh, the other things I have with me, but I still have, still have a few odds and ends. Shock did great. That's amazing. I see you met other people as well. I haven't introduced myself to them. And Misha will do so. I'm not going to do the whole introduction, but... And as Misha goes off to introduce themselves, Ayn just goes over to you, Shock and Hop, and quietly says, I have something I need to show all of you. Well, let's not waste any time then. And as she walks away, she adds, Not you, Rock Ryan! Fine, I didn't really want to go anyway! I didn't think he would follow us even if we wanted him to. No, <laughs> there's no way. I want to check out some fossils. Yeah, I don't care about any of that. And he just turns his back. He doesn't acknowledge any of you. But one last time, B waves and says, Goodbye! Come back if you ever need any help! That's what they said we did. So you make a way through the tunnels that Hop had seen earlier. It seems like everyone got here through that pathway that leads to the shore, but you don't go back through that pathway. Instead, you take the fork on the road and you go deeper into the depths of the ruins of Coachman's Tree. To most of you, this walk feels the same as the remainder of Coachman's Tree. Sure, you can't see anything because it's super dark, but you couldn't see anything above ground either. And most of the space is still illuminated by these bright neon netting and this haphazard wooden assembly. But with each step, Misha, you feel more and more of your memory return. And while no one else notices it, a small red light on the wall continues to grow brighter. You eventually make your way to a room. Ayn goes to let everyone in, but Misha, you feel almost as if a force is holding you back. Something that's like tightening your neck as if you're like, you're struggling to to breathe, you know, you're breathless. 
And then you realize it's very physical as your scarf, which had been kind of apprehensive, <laughs> seems to aggressively not want to enter the room. Oh. Oh. I will say as they were approaching, Misha would have reached for Shock's hand and like hold it. And as they are approaching more, they would like hold it more tight. Shock will give a squeeze of reassurance. The scarf continues to pull, but eventually realizing you won't give up, it relents and it slips its other end into your other hand. You're not sure if it's comforting you or itself. And the room reverberates with this loud echoey sound as you enter. Ah, home speed home. That's what you call it, right, I? <laughs> yes, that is what I call my space, CK. I would not use it for this. This space is a bit darker than the rest. It seems whoever was in charge of it did not like the neon lights of Coachman's Tree. The only light you can really make out at all are the few candles from Cubo and then that bright red spotlight coming from Misha's eye. But you don't need to see the space to know it, Misha. In front of all of you, Ayn is shuffling through some drawers. She seems to be looking for something. She pushes past some blueprints. She pushes past a large ratty lab coat. She pushes past this little, it looks like a, a radio relay that when she bumps into it actually sparks with life and just starts whirring around as if it's trying to pick up a signal. And as she continues to ruffle, Ayn says, make yourselves as comfortable as you can, I guess. I know it's not the most welcoming place in the beyond. Even if it were, I don't think I would feel very comfortable here regardless. And at that, she stops and just takes in a breath. I should probably explain to all of you why you're here. This is the lab of Dr. Cygnus Collodi. 45 years ago, this lab was the site where the lady with cinnabar lips should have died. But she didn't. And in this moment, Misha, you don't understand everything. You don't remember everything. It's rushing back quickly. It's making its way there. But while you don't remember everything, you don't understand everything. You do understand why Ein's statement has to be true. We know the lady with cinnabar lips didn't die. Because I didn't. You don't go back through that pathway. Instead, you take the fork on the road and you go deeper into the depths of the blog. The blog. <laughs> well, I mean, it's already filled with Vine references, so maybe the bog really is called the blog. <laughs> the blog? The blog. The great blog of the Ba Danu Forest. Is that truly what all of the the <laughs> messages of the preserve are all along? It's just comments from people on blogs. <laughs> you blog comments. It's so good. Yes. <laughs> Had yes. I not been calling it the oh bog this God. whole time, I would hard course to calling it the blog. You've, you've been calling it the bog. The blog came out of nowhere. It just happens to work really well. It works so well. We're going to flash forward to the scene where this is happens. Ness walks up, hands the piece of paper to Hop. Hop says, yeah, this won't hold up in court. And then says, actually, I don't know, considering their understanding of laws. <laughs> that was the plan. Ness is going to be like, this is legally binding. It is written in crayon. <laughs> <laughs> and Hopper is like, I don't know about that, <laughs> but let me do some research because he wants it to be legally binding. I've derailed the whole scene. I'm so sorry. I just wanted everybody to know 